All right, so we have uh, quarter after. Uh, first of all, I consider this a real blessing to be asked to, to speak because you guys are going to help me with the daily issue I have today. So you guys are a huge blessing to me. Secondly, you know, when I did, did an auction in front of my dad for the first time, who was an auctioneer for 31 years, I was really nervous. And this was in Mequon. You know, it's for a Ducks Unlimited. Today I'm kind of preaching and our pastor is here. And I'm not nervous at all. Because I'm going to show him how I can get this done in 15 minutes. So Pastor Brian, you might want to take notes. You know, like, hey, you know, huh? <laughs> Did you hear that up front here? No. Um, so thank you very much for allowing me to be here. And again, as I, as I mentioned, you're going to be a, a big part of my process today. Uh, I'm David Clairbout. Um been in Newsburg all my life. I'm 60 years old and just uh, excited about being here. The, the, I titled this uh, Overcoming Obstacles with God's Help. Let me, uh, I wanted to do it this way so you could follow along maybe a little uh, easy. Obstacles are part of the Christian journey. And you know, as one famous person said, especially part of a man's journey, obstacles are daily. Um, thank you, Captain Obvious. And whenever I say Captain Obvious, I think of Ruth, Ruth Arnson. Ruth Arnson used to be a, uh, a receptionist at Dutchland. I remember walking in one morning, I said to Ruth, morning, Ruth, and she looked at me and said, what? I said, morning, Ruth. She said, Shawnee, it's good morning. It's obvious to me it's morning. So I always remember Ruth teaching me that, and I was going to give, uh, who, who started it out today? Toby? Didn't he ask everybody to say morning? I can't wait to see him and say, good morning, Toby. So, first the good news about our, our uh, obstacles. We'll not have to deal with any obstacles when we get to heaven. That is fantastic news. Um, I don't know how many of you are anxious to get to heaven. What I think is going to be about, awesome about it is there's going to be zero obstacles. You know, there's going to be a lot of things that we deal with on a daily basis. They are not going to exist in heaven. Secondly, now the harsh reality, guys. As long as we are on earth, each of us has a potential to show, uh, let obstacles destroy our faith. How many would agree with that? That obstacles are probably going to certainly have the opportunity to destroy our faith. Today, you know, I think it's it would be great if we could stare down the learn how to stare down the obstacles, kind of similar to how David and Goliath did. I don't think I have to repeat the David and Goliath story. I mean, talk about the underdog against the favorite. Uh, obviously, David was the underdog, and he had a huge obstacle in front of him. Before we do that, though, I think what is really key to give me any credibility when I can talk on a subject like this, I want to tell you about the largest obstacle that I face daily. That I face daily, and when I face it daily, when I handle it daily, it allows me to deal with other obstacle, obstacles that God is putting in my life. And trust me, God didn't just put one obstacle in my life or yours. He's kind of loading it on all the time. I don't know if you ever ever feel that. And once in a while, I think, David, you just think it's an obstacle because it's uncomfortable. These are some really important numbers to me. And I apologize. I keep reading. I'm going to see if this works over here. 56,964. The next one is 2,363 days. You guys are probably going, what? Where's Claire about going with this? 77.53 months. Really important numbers to me. 6.46 years. So that's a lot of different numbers. And if you add them all up, it doesn't mean anything. What it simply means to me is that's the day Jesus Christ gave me the gift of sobriety. August 15th, 2012. Now when I say sobriety, I just want to make it very clear. Sobriety to Dave and Claire about complete sobriety and to any addict, any drug, or any alcoholic is nothing. Nothing. Because we don't have the option to have a couple of beers and still say, I'm still sober though. I can't have a beer. I can. 
However, it'll be a really poor choice. A really poor choice of mine to have a beard. Wyman always tells me, Shawnee, don't pick up the first one. That's crazy. Somebody asked me once, Shawnee, do you ever miss having a beard? Well, first thing I see is, I'm not sure I ever had a beard. <laughs> you know? uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure that ever uh, really happened. However, um, our family, my brother Carl is sitting in front, will agree with everything I say here. We never saw our father inebriated. We never saw our mother inebriated. Why in the world would one of five children decide to really abuse alcohol? Doesn't make sense. I, and then our family, I think, with the exception of one, is very smart. My dad, who a lot of you know, is a very smart businessman, just a very smart person overall. My mother is, uh, and, and my father's watching from heaven today, so he has zero obstacles going on. <laughs> My mother, um, very smart lady. Our oldest brother, Stan, some of you know him. Class valedictorian, straight A's. I drank more on a weekend than Stan's drank in his life, and he's 67 years old. My sister, Mary, I think she was salutatory. Uh, she is uh, 64 years old, same story. I drank more on a weekend than she's drank all her life. My next up. Uh, uh, Carl, another very smart individual in the family, and we've both been known to tip him back. So I've got all these smart siblings above me. Thank goodness I came along for them and lowered the bar. <laughs> so then I come along, and now I have a younger sister who drinks socially. So where does this all happen? Why in the, why in the world is this something that I can't handle? Well, you know what? It's, it's no mistake. It, it, I don't believe in coincidences. You know, they really set me up great today. They set me up great with the different talks that were there. And, and best of all, I think, is they set me up about 75 steps away from where it all started. A lot of you probably remember when they the Clearbaugh House, it was called. The brick house over there. Bill and Nancy and raised, uh, raised his five children over there. We sold it. Do you, know, do you know how many steps it is to our old house? 75 steps. Do you know how I know that? Because when my dad and mom decided to sell the house and move up um, on South 6th Street, they put it up for sale and only one couple looked at that house. Joe and Agnes Westerbeck. Joe Westerbeck never, how many of you remember Joe? Joe and Agnes. Joe Westerbeck never walked in the house. Agnes walked through the house. My dad came out with my mom and um, my dad looked over at Joe and said, don't you want to come on in the house? And Joe said, nope, we'll take it. <laughs> My dad said, Joe, I haven't even showed you the house. He says, it's 75 steps from the back door of church. We'll take it. <laughs> and you know what? <laughs> that means so much to me because I'm using it today. I said I was one of our numbers. About 55 steps is where our old garage used to be. I, I was in seventh grade when we moved up to South 6th Street went on and I went off to college after that, after I graduated. And actually, Teresa and I, the very, the second house we ever owned, we first owned a house at the bank, the second house we ever owned was here. And it really meant a lot to me because we actually bought it from Joe and Agnes. You know, so there was nobody, between my parents and Joe and Agnes, Teresa and I uh, moved in. I remember walking in the back hall and the magnetic board is still there and it said, welcome home, Shawnee. You know, and I thought, man, this is so good. And now when I think back about that, to that house, that's where the alcoholism started. And I will make it very clear to everyone here today, nobody, nobody is to blame. Nobody held a funnel in my mouth. If anybody held a funnel in my mouth when I drank, I would ask for two funnels. Trust me. Nobody, nobody but David. There's not a single person in my life, not a single bartender, not a single establishment is responsible for my behavior. It's David Clairbaugh. And to give you just some of the weird things that we alcoholics do and drug addicts do, because we're one and the same, I still see that garage over there. I still see that garage. 
that I still see walking out there in a, with my jacket on, with a beer in this pocket, a beer in this pocket, carrying a beer. This Teresa thought, that's normal. He's going outside with a beer. He's going to go work in the garage. Let me remind you about these two guys here. We have no idea which side of the hammer to hold. What am I going to do in the garage? <laughs> I had some really nice tools. In fact, if anybody needs some brand new, well, they're not brand new. They're about 35 years old. They've never been used. <laughs> the times, I would say, yeah. I gotta go in the garage, there's a lot of stuff to do out there. <laughs> in theory, I should have had the cleanest floor in, in town, in the garage, and that's where it all started. And when I look back, I just go, why did you think that behavior was acceptable? And this is the mind. This is the mindset of an addict. This is the mindset of an alcoholic. Because I went to one of my friends' house one day. And he is what I call a normie. He can drink a couple of beers, and put it away. That's a normie, okay? That's in the world of alcoholism, we call those people normies. He was having a beer wax in his car on a Saturday morning, all by himself. And I came by there in the afternoon, he was having a, he was having a, a Diet Coke or whatever. However, I just hung on, I clung, and this is gonna sound weird to you guys, I just clung on the fact that, I'm not gonna say his name, was having a beer by himself, and that opened up all the doors. And I'll tell you, until the age of 54, it was every, every reason I could drink by myself because of that one instance of seeing him having a beer. A lot of you are going, Claire, about what's going on in this, in this head of yours. Are you, are you relishing this? Are you, are you making this up? This is how I think. This is how I think because i got to support something. i got to justify something. And I don't want to give up. I don't want to give it up. And the other thing that I always think about, the fact that Teresa and I went out with some dear friends one Saturday night. He got in the car, and he had had four beers before we picked them up. And it was because he had four beers with his employees. That gave me all the excuses in the world it was okay to drink before we went out with people. And up until the end, I will tell you right now, if I'm going to go out drinking with you, I'm going to drink ahead because I don't know how much you're going to drink. And you're going to drive me freaking nuts if you sit there with a beer for a half hour. You really will. I'll go up the wall. I will just go up the wall. So I got to do the layups before the game. And I'm going to do them at home. So, you know, I kept this going and I would say it really kind of started at 30 years old. And as I look back, I joined, I asked Christ into my life at Camp Manitoba. I was a member at First Reformed Church growing up. I became a Christian like in seventh grade. Many, that was a really important day in my life. However, at 30 years old, when suddenly, this is what I had to do so often, not just drink this, I had a first check. Anybody else? And then it was this. Who does that? What normal guy would do that? So it started at 30 years old. And, you know, I look around and there's a lot of us that have gone out together and I didn't do it then because, you know what, we just had a good time. However, it started to get the better of me. <clears throat> I could function. I could teach Sunday school. I could go to church. I could do auctions in front of, I don't care how many people at the Pfister. Um, I could go on sales calls. I could be a half owner of Dutch and Plastics. I could, I could really kind of be a successful person. However, there is a side to me that as the alcohol abuse continued, I was becoming much more secretive. I didn't want any of you guys to know. I didn't, I didn't want Teresa to know, I didn't want the kids to know. And you know, I, I just, I can't, I gotta somehow keep this under wraps. So you move from that house. 
that they're hiding it in the basement there, hiding it in the garage. We move over to, um, is it uh, Kent Van Hals? Pastor Van Hals, was that his, his place? Basement wasn't finished. First thing we did, Bob Galvor, um, trying to think who did, was it Gart? Put in a sports bar downstairs. Remember my sports bar? It was beautiful. And there's nothing, before I go even any farther, I am not here, guys, to say drinking is wrong. Oh my gosh, Jesus drank wine. And this is not going to be all on my alcoholism. I just want to lend some credibility here and tell you some craziness that I'm all about. I had a really cool sports bar down there, but it was a great place for me to say when we're upstairs, hey, anybody want a drink? I'll run down and get it for you. Well, it's pretty crazy when somebody goes down, starts mixing the drinks, and I always make sure your beers were strong, because I don't want to be the only one getting hammered here. And oh, by the way, I'm looking up the stairs, nobody's coming down, straight out of the Southern Comfort bottle. I love Southern Comfort. Who drinks straight out of a Southern Comfort bottle? Worse yet, I mean, Southern Comfort shots, that's normal. Straight out of the bottle and looking around to make sure. And oh, by the way, 24 hours later, I'm going to be at church. And I'm going to be teaching Sunday school. Crazy. Crazy, crazy. Moved there to my parents' house that's uh, on South 6th Street. That's where it really started going, the early 2000s. I finally was approached by my family because uh, I want to go back to, um, I was telling you how intelligent our family was. Up until I really addressed my alcoholism, our family had no idea what alcoholism was. They knew, my mother always told us growing up, just don't drink so much that you're like so-and-so. There was an individual that we knew, he can't even have lung cake. That's how allergic he is to alcohol. Wow. Otherwise, there's no way that any of us are going to be alcoholics. Anybody in this town would be an alcoholic because they all have jobs. They all go to church. You know, the alcoholic is the guy pushing the cart in downtown Milwaukee, pushing the cart over in Chicago, whatever. Just kind of our overall mentality in our, our household that alcoholism is not as prevalent. It's, it's just not going to happen. Well, they finally came to grips saying, you know what, David had a problem drinking. David was a problem drink, drinker. So in 2008, and I always, I always denied that I had a drinking problem. I used to joke, I got a drinking problem, I'm out of beer, or I'm out of vodka. That's a real, real drinking problem when I'm out of booze. So when I, um, 2008, my brother Carl, my wife Teresa, my mother was on the phone. Do you remember this? Up in the, con in the showroom. Um, Billy. And Lindy were up there, and they were all pleading for me to stop drinking. They were going to send me out to, I think it was in Minnesota. He has a big plan for me to go to Minnesota, and I'm like, next. Sales call. Uh, yeah, <laughs> sales call, yeah. So um, we bartered for about an hour and a half. I had to go to rehab because I had some type of drinking problem. Finally, at the last <coughs> second, I said to them, I will send an email out to our friends. I'll send an email out to customers. I'll send an email out to suppliers telling them I have a drinking problem and I need to stop drinking. And you guys bought into that. You guys were the biggest suckers there were. <laughs> I'll show you the email. I'll show you the email, how I wrote it. I said in there, it's obvious I have a drinking problem. I'm going to stop drinking. Went on, talked a little bit more about it. I mean, that's like asking Dave and Claire about when he was drinking. How many beers did you have? Two. I was not lying. I might have had 22. You ask me how many beers I had. Yeah. Am I lying when I say two? No, I'm not. Now, ask me how many total beers I had. I'm going to change the subject because, <laughs> you know what, I don't want to come clean. So when I wrote that email, and I still have it, and I told people I was going to quit drinking, I never told them how long. As far as I was concerned, 24 hours later, I lived up to my email. But then these guys said, if you don't quit drinking, you're going to lose half of Dubs, or uh, you're going to have to go to rehab. No, I was going to lose half of Dubs and lose my family. Wow. I had to freaking think about that. Dubs, family, Southern Comfort. Dubs, family, Southern Comfort. And I would stand here for a while. It's like, come on. 
I gave it up for two years. And one night I came home from work, wasn't a bad day, wasn't a good day, normal day, I still had booze in my house, had a glass of wine. Okay, everything's cool, that was on a Monday. Came home from work Tuesday, had a glass of wine. I tried that four nights in a row, and you know what? I was convinced. Not an alcoholic. That's obvious. I just said four. I spent four nights in a row drinking one glass of wine. Saturday morning, couldn't remember Friday night. Sunday morning, I couldn't remember Saturday night, because that's how David Clearwell drinks. Uncontrollable. And you won't know it because you might come to my door and ring the doorbell next, and I don't answer. Shawnee's not home. Drink the blackout. I carried that on for about a year and a half. Never let this guy know, my partner in business. Never let him know. Pleaded with his friends not to tell him. And it worked. Finally, my kid said, this is it. Dad, you were freaking out of control. I'll never forget. <coughs> August 14th, golfing down at Kenosha Country Club. Knew Carl wasn't going to be there, so guess what? Dave and Clairbaugh loves to drink and drive. Now let me confirm what that means. That doesn't mean I love to get drunk at home and go driving. That's important to me. When I drove, I drank. There was always booze with me if I was by myself. Crazy, isn't it? You know how far Gibbs Hill is from here? About two beers. <laughs> If I'm going fast. <laughs> that's how, that's me. That's the life of an addict, of an alcoholic. So, having a great time. Having a great time down at Kenosha Country Club. Golf from another guy who, yeah, he's not going to tell Carl about me. And we were popping him all day. Um, he, not as much as me. We're sitting in the bar after. Having a couple. A couple. He didn't ask me how many. Take two of them out to the car, we sit down in my car, I'm ready to turn the key on, there's a knock on the, knock on the window, it's my son Billy. He said, Spud, what are you doing here? I said, Dad, it's time to get help. I'm like, what do you mean? I get out of the car, I've got a brother crying back there, I've got a daughter crying back there, I've got a daughter-in-law crying back there, and my son Billy's crying. And guys, Forgive me for this. I was crying because I figured I couldn't drink anymore. I didn't care about that. I made it look like I did. You guys brought me to a place in Milwaukee. Uh, they were pretty sure, pretty convinced that I would have to stay overnight in Milwaukee. Well, here was the key. This is what helped me tremendously. They said, we're going to go give you an assessment, take one family member along. My children didn't know how much I was drinking. He didn't, so guess who I asked along? I, and I'll be I BS my way through that whole assessment. We came out, you know, and he didn't know the better. We came out and the lady looked at our whole family and said, he's just got to sleep it off. And I went, oh, sweet. Not, they didn't give in. David, don't return to Dutch and Plastics. You're not welcome there. Friday, we're going to do an alcohol assessment. We're going to go to the EAP at Memorial Hospital in Sheboygan. So they, they took us there and this time I couldn't lie my whole family was there and it was I was just waiting for that guy he just needs to cut back David you need uh, professional help you need to go away for a while can you imagine two things you're going to take away what's most important to me my drinking and then secondly I have to go get help with this you know, I have an auction Monday. I have a sales call on Tuesday, and this is on Friday. And you guys were just jerks about it. And I thank you so often for it. They'll find another auctioneer. Not as good as this one. They'll, we'll find another person to make the call. Not as good as this one. This egotistical, nobody else can do it better than me. <clears throat> By the grace of God, Nova, where I went to, Had a bed open, not till Wednesday. So I had from Friday to Wednesday. Mm. And I get to do the auction on Monday. First time ever. West Spring Mutual with uh, John McLaughlin. 
I was not happy I had to go. Friday I got home. Uh, Friday I got home. You guys had come to my house and poured all the beer out of my house. Talk about a sad sight and all these beer bottles, all the vodka bottles, everything being down the drain. I mean, I was losing a big part of my family there. Everything poured down the drain. And they said, you better not drink. I didn't sleep very well that night. I got up at four in the morning. I walked around this very, and I started talking out loud to God, saying, God, obviously something's wrong with me. You gotta help me with this. But guys, by the time I got back to my house around six o'clock, I'm not that fast a walker. I was so ready to go here. I was ready to give it up. It was exhausting. Some of you in here are in recovery and you know how much time and effort we put into this. We're always thinking about the next drink. And guess what? I could go weeks without it because I had so many things going on. I could tell you the next time I'd have it, what it was, where it was going to be. I went up to Nova and I spent 26 days here. I've had really some cool times in my life. Becoming a Christian in seventh grade was really important to me. Getting married to Teresa was really important to me. The birth of Lindy, the birth of Billy, the birth of my grandchildren, getting remarried to Sandy, all really great days. Might be the most important days of my life. Because it was God giving me grace, saying, Clara, listen up. Listen up. You got a freaking problem. Here's a solution. God gave me grace on August 15th. He gave me a gift of sobriety. And I so bad don't want to be an Indian giver on it. I'm going to read you. So you go up to Nova. And you, what you have to do is a first step. So a first step. You basically, and you have to do one every day. Have three people sign off on it. You have to... Uh, number one, use more than you intended. Number two, love self-respect through the behavior. Number three, endanger the life of others. Four, hurt yourself. Five, broke a promise. Six, broke a promise. Be specific what happened every day. You had to write out. And trust me, for me to remember 28 days I was drunk was not that hard. The challenging part, because they got really tough on me, was, well, how much did you have that day? Guys, I didn't know how much I had that day. I really didn't. I just know it was vodka, because you guys can't smell vodka. Right? <laughs> so I thought, if somebody has a Bloody Mary with a shot of vodka in it, probably can't smell it in somebody. If you have one of my Bloody Marys, I never screw up a good Bloody Mary tomato juice. Don't want to do that. <coughs> An alcoholic, when we drink vodka, we drink vodka. So anyway, this was not day 12. About 10 years ago, did the typical Dave and Claire about Sunday rituals. Got up, go to church, and then have cocktails. I would switch from Bloody Marys, I had two that day, to very strong Southern Comforts. You know, I would take a 12 ounce of uh, uh, diet, oh, it's been a while since I made those, but diet uh, seven up, diet Sprite. I could probably get 10 old fashions out of there. That's how crazy, that's how crazy I am when I drink. At halftime of the Packer game, Billy had friends over for football, and I was always designated quarterback. So Billy's in high school at this time, and he brings his buddies over, and I'm always a designated quarterback. Now, these are not small dudes. It's Billy. It's Mike. It's Drew Tempest. You guys know Drew Tempest. I mean, the guy's a horse. And Luke Mills, he's a horse. So I'm the designated quarterback, so I can always just go back and throw the ball. Little did I know Luke, or not. Drew was going to blitz. <laughs> Drew Tempest hit me pretty hard, and I went flying backwards, slamming my head very against, very hard against the grass. I mean, to the point, I think I should have had a concussion. And I remember those guys looking at me and just laughing. These are high school boys looking at one of their friends' dad. All those in attendance were shocked that I jumped right up like nothing happened, because I had to cover my drink. And I do recall leaving my office keys on the deck for two days that day, and I couldn't find them. Who was neg negatively affected by this episode? David, Billy, Drew, Luke, Kevin, Jake. Oh, Kevin Mentick was there. Jake, Mike, and me. How do you feel about this now? I'm embarrassed. How long before you drank again? Three days. Don't you think a normal guy would quit drinking after something like that? 
So that's what they really taught me at Nova is, you know what, you got to come clean. You got to come clean with others. You got to, I don't like the word brutally honest or somewhat honest or perfectly honest. If you're okay with me, I'm just going to be honest. I had to be honest with other people. This is how much I drink. And since then, since I came from Nova, they told me as I walked out there, you have to have a sponsor. Carl had lined up a sponsor for me. Jerry's been my sponsor now for six years. Uh, my sponsor is 84 years old, 27 years sober, and goes to four meetings a week. You know, he talked about the AA meetings today. Did you hear, uh, uh, what's the speaker's name? Gordon. 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 I was going to go, amen! <laughs> That's what keeps me alive. <clears throat> On the left is the 1907 Club. How many of you remember North Pole? North Pole? That's right, right just past North Pole. And this is the Right Way Club. How many of you go up in Riverdale? No, that is not a bar across the street going north a little bit, which I always thought it was. It's an AA place. And my, I almost stopped in there a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> they do have a bar in there, though. It's a coffee bar. So... And then, of course, you know, they said, David, you got to go to meetings. I went to one. I went to see Ramesh Kapoor and uh, Benita Springs. I was so, so, yeah. so nervous to go to a meeting outside of Sheboygan County. I drove up. I was nervous to walk in the church. And guess what? I sat down there with a bunch of brothers and sisters from different mothers. I knew them better than I knew my wife. And I know John, who I think I know well. I met my brother, Carl. I never met those guys before. I knew their exact behavior. Overcoming obstacles with God's help. God's plan was to send someone very special and others into my life. First of all, thank you. You are keeping me sober today because I'm being very open. Secondly, crazy, crazy, one year sober. I'm out in North Carolina. I go to meetings on the road when I'm on the road for Dutchman. I'm out in North Carolina, get a year in, and this gal walks in to the meeting, Walks into the meeting and say, walks over to me and said, hey, I'm Connie, I'm an alcoholic. I said, hey, I'm David. I'm an alcoholic. And Connie says to me, so how long have you been sober, David? And I reach into my keychain. I'm going to pass this around because it always helps to have trained people on it. This is my six-year coin. I pull out my one-year coin. She goes, congratulations, and she hugs me. I said, Connie, how long have you been sober? She said, David, I know it's a 24-hour day program. I get that. I get that. However, if I make it a Wednesday, I get a year, cho a year coin. I hugged her and I said, Connie, I'm so proud of you. And she said, and I, I, exact words, I hope it's okay I use this word. She said, you know what sucks about that, David? I said, what? She said, I have a 30-year coin from two years ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going, hang on, you're beautiful. I, I don't... God said, I got to send Connie in David's life to remind him it's a lifetime sentence. There's zero cure. I'm always in recovery. I will never be recovered. And the fact that this beautiful lady about my age, I mean, you guys would look three times at her. Be honest. That's not an obstacle. That's just a temptation. You'd look three times at her. You would look at her. Brian, am I in trouble with you? No. You would look... Huh? You would look at her three times. And you know what? Four drunk driving tickets. No family anymore, no grandchildren, no job. Connie, why did you go back to do some more research? Because I stopped going to meetings. So guys, I'm having a meeting right here. You're keeping me sober. I was at one yesterday. It's so very important to me, and God made that so clear to me. So... I just wanted to suggest that there are a couple of diff different addictions in there. <coughs> just take a look at all of them. And you know what? I got some of these too. That really stinks. <laughs> Gosh, really? Just look at all of them. I don't know if you can identify with any of them. I think the whole world has this addiction. Gosh, so many times. So, there's my credibility about by me addressing my alcoholism every day. I kind of put aside at least that sinful behavior. You know, it's no. It, I'm going to sin today. I've uh, I've already sinned. We're all going to sin. I would guess at some point today. You guys got about 12, 13 hours to do it yet. So let's let's face it. 
um, there's going to be sin in your life. If you perhaps have an addiction, I'm not suggesting anyone here does, but if you have something that's so important to you that it keeps, that it makes all the other obstacles in your life challenging, think about it today and maybe consider for a day to say, <coughs> I got this issue going on. What is it the most that you fear you couldn't live with, live without? And that's walking into the AA meeting. I mean, that first step, that first meeting is challenging. Am I going to give up those pills? Am I going to give up beer? Am I going to give up Southern Comfort? It's, it's tough. Trusting God for strength and wisdom to deal with the obstacles. There are certain obstacles, addictions, and spider attempts to deal with them by ourselves render us powerless. For the longest time, I was going to take care of my alcohol issue by myself. And finally, this is the biggest step of 12. The biggest step of 12. I'm powerless. I give up. I can't do it. No matter what I try, quit drinking for two weeks, have one glass of wine, I can't do it. I can't do it. i got to say that daily. I say it every morning. I understand today is another day where I can't handle it. I know I found myself, some of my issues are way too big for God to handle. He doesn't want to spend time on Really, guys? Really, David? There's nothing too big in your life, in my life, that he can't handle. <clears throat> to think I thought it was too big a task, or he didn't want to spend time on me, was such an egotistical part of the disease. I recognize now why I'm an alcoholic. I really do. It's in my DNA, first of all. I don't have a choice. Again, nobody held a funnel in my mouth. However, it has allowed me to work with other people that are exactly like me. And and, and you know what, guys? I have friends in, in AA that are atheists. They say, David, you got to be kidding me. My time will come where I can sneak Christ in there. Sneak in what Christ has done for me. But it's, it's Brian, you know too, it's such a sales job. You got to take the right time. But if they're not sober, I can't talk to them about it. You know, step two is admitting that there's a higher power greater than you. I was at a meeting yesterday, February 1st, so we talked about step two. This one lady, she's not a devil worshiper, and <clears throat> believe in God, her higher power is like me. Please don't laugh, because it only keeps her sober. And it came from my time to talk. AA is a, a spiritual organization. It's not a religious organization. So I pounced on it very lightly. I was rewriting it up in Nova when I went to Nova Counseling in Oshkosh. After I started professing my, my faith in Jesus Christ, I was told to shut up by a counselor. And I went, cool. So I will tell you right now, my higher power is Christ. He's given me another day of sobriety. And Christ also had a lot with each of you being born because when you were born, they said you're going to meet this crazy guy from Leesburg. You can help him. So that wasn't too hard of a sales job on Christ, right? So my alcoholism has given me an opportunity to profess what Christ has done for me. And it certainly has convince or help me convince other people this not 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 when you drink and drive just hand these over to Christ. Let him drive every single facet of your life. I always joke, I gave the keys over to him, I always fall shotgun. I don't want to sit in the back. I gotta see what's going on. And maybe that's the best. I don't know. But I gotta call shotgun. So put aside, I'm just in uh, reminding, put aside all sinful behaviors, trusting God for strength and wisdom to deal with the ob obstacles. Know that nothing is too hard for God. Recognize that God uses obstacles for his purposes. I will tell you now, write this down, photograph, memory, Mark Batterson. Mark Batterson. The most important DVD I've ever read, ever watched in my life. Circle maker. Everybody say Mark Batterson on three. One, two, three. Mark Batterson. Circle Maker. Circle Maker, and we have it in our men's group, and it is awesome. It is awesome because what it basically has told us 
you start every day. You find a place in your house that's unique. The same time every day, you go down there, and it's you and God. And Sandy knows when I go downstairs and sit at this table, that chair is not for her. You know who sits? This is my chair, Jesus. You know who sits there? i got to ask the Holy Spirit to sit down with me because when I sit down there at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, I'm already solving some issues at Dutchman or about the auction I did the night before or about stuff coming up because my mind drifts, believe it or not. And I'm not sitting down there thinking about the next drink. I'm thinking about my day. So I just, Holy Spirit, you got to take over. Because I drift so much, I write down every single person, every single person I pray for. And I'm not, I'm just telling you what works for me. This will go with me today because we're staying in Burlington tonight after an auction. And Sandy knows I'm going to open this up tomorrow morning in a hotel room and write it down. Mark Batterson, did you remember that name? Mm -hmm. It's an awesome, awesome DVD. I stay sober because I talk to God every morning and because he's a, he's a man of grace and he just has helped me so much. So the challenge, you don't have to write this down, just remember it. For 21 days, 21 days, guys. Raise your hand if you'll consider this challenge. Raise your hand if you'll consider it. Find a unique place in your house away from all distraction. Because if you say, well, I'll just wake up in the morning and do it in bed. No, 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 no. No. Find a place in your house that's unique away from all distractions. I had one at the big house. I had one at the Gordy at the place we rented from you by Haven. We'd still be there if you would have had a two-car garage, by the way. <laughs> and <I'll, laughs> the other one I rented you from Gordy. Uh, I have a place down there. The same table. All three places. Because you know what? That table has saved my life. So find a unique place in your house. Guys, okay? Unique place in your house. Kind of set a time of day when you're going to take the challenge. I do it right away in the morning. Right away in the morning. Kickstart my day. First thing I say, help me stay sober today because you know I'm a crazy man. Ask the Holy Spirit to be with you as you pray for yourself and others. Pull up another chair there. You know? Because if you're like me, there's a lot of stuff going on in your mind. And above all, confess. You heard some confession from me today. And you know, Max Lucado came into my life also through our men's group. Confession is a radical reliance on God's grace. God is grace. God has given us so much. He's given David so much grace for all the crazy, stupid stuff I did. I have to come clean. And if during the next day, next 21 days, you don't pray, if you're going to do this for 21 days, I got a hunch you're going to do it long. I really do. Make it to February 23rd. And if you want to take it another day on the 24th, thank God for somebody who turned 63 that day, my brother Carmen. Pray for each other. Guys, please. It's awesome. And finally, I just want to make sure everybody knows the largest obstacle in my life is alcoholism. My intent here was not to suggest anybody here has this issue going on. I want to repeat. I thought it was important for me to come clean with my biggest obstacle and kind of dealing with that day by day because since I become <coughs> sober, God's put some other obstacles in my life and I'm rolling right along. I mean, there, there are opportunities to grow. Sometimes I just go, really? Okay. Why is this? Okay, thank you. Well, did I really say thank you? <laughs> did he give that to my brother instead? I, don't. <laughs> I get it. I wouldn't have got it if I wasn't sober. And there were some kind of significant obstacles since I got sober, and they're not significant. They're just God saying, David, roll with it. So please. Identify that obstacle in your life right now that is going to prohibit, that's going to prevent you 
from having that relationship with God to the point that you can at least spend the first 15 minutes of the day. can't stand it anymore because life is really good in that stuff. You just can't stand it. Kneel. Get out of sleep book. Thank you so much. Um, you, you guys probably don't understand. And if you're in recovery right now, you will know what I'm talking about. We kept the sober cool. <laughs> Tomorrow. This is how, I don't know about tomorrow. What do you mean? I do. Although I do know when I'm in Burlington tomorrow morning, that's the first thing I'm going to do when I get up. <coughs> I'm going to pray and say, God, help us this over to me. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, John Grove. So when you, and I know you, you've been an inspiration to other people going through struggles like yours, it was part of that when you first meet that guy or gal, um, kind of compare notes and, and establish that credibility with them, or is that not important? Did you hear what John asked? John was wondering uh, when someone, when I meet that guy or person <clears throat> to talk about addiction, alcoholism, do we compare notes and everything? There's a couple of things that are really important. First of all, I work with 250 people. You don't think we have a couple of alcoholics that got some plastics? Let's let's be realistic. We might have some at the bank. We might have some, you know, on all your travels. It is not. It is the worst thing for me to approach somebody and say, I think you might have a problem with alcohol. Do you want to talk? The sales pitch is, John, you come to me. That's number one. And number two, they will be shocked initially, especially if they've ever, never been through it. How well I know them. You go up in Nova, one of the first things you do is you start comparing stories where you hit your booze and everything. Every, yeah, yeah, yeah. The only unique story I ever heard at Nova was this gal who actually cleaned out her windshield wiper fluid tank, rerouted the lines <laughs> into her car, and filled the tank with vodka. So when she wanted a drink, she just turned on to wash her windshield. It would go on her cup. And I'm like, we should have hired you as director of engineering. And <laughs> <laughs> but then again, I went, how crazy. You know what David Carbot did? I just I would always buy the handle ones so I could just reach behind the car. Reach behind my seat while I'm driving. So when I say those stories, John, to another alcoholic, it's not a surprise. And that's the beauty of an AA meeting. And I will speak up at Nova on Wednesday, because that place saved my life. I speak there every other month. They walk in, and the first thing I will tell them, I ever have this rehearsed every time, old well, people say, you must be so courageous. It really takes a lot of guts, takes a lot of courage to talk to this many people. That's what, you know, when, when I say at Nova, the most courageous people at Nova are the ones sitting in the seat, because I've been there, and your family just said, get help. You know what, if you take God there with you, it's not a breeze. It makes it very tolerable. Stephen, when you first quit drinking and you go out with friends where there is alcohol, like a restaurant or something like that, did your friends that knew you quit ask you, do you want a drink? Or what happened to me was the guys were mad because I quit drinking and they were still doing a lot of drinking. Yeah. Went to a wedding. And I had I my drink was Christian Brothers brand. Well, I, I would do that against you. Yeah. <laughs> it went down a little easier. Yeah. Anyway, um, all of a sudden I had glasses of brandy sitting in front of me. I told my wife, "Come on, let's go home." Called the waitress over and I says, "Take that junk. I'm not drinking it." I says, "They bought it and they know I don't drink." And it makes them mad when you yeah, don't get yeah, drunk with them. Yeah. What, what's your name, sir? Joe Turnus. You know Joe, my son, Joel. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you what, Joe. Uh, I never lost a friend. In fact, some of my great friends that are so supportive sit right in the front row here. 
I made it very clear to them when I got out of Nova, this is a lifetime thing. It's not Craig Mentic, who I consider my best friend, we grew up together, came up to Nova to visit me, which meant the world. And Craig said to me, So when you get back home, will you just can you just have a couple of beers here and there? That's the ignorance that and I'm not picking on Craig. And Craig's a normie. No. So I made it very clear when I got back, Joe. Yeah. And I even lost a friend now. Oh, I usually was the last one at a wedding. Yeah. We're usually one of the first ones home, you know, because I, I, I didn't. People drink any. in front of me, does it bother me at all? I'll be at an auction tonight. With, oh, I'm, the one this afternoon is for Rabbits Unlimited. <laughs> I think there was such a big for Rabbits Unlimited. Do you think you have a couple of beers there? It's, it'll be all around me. I just, I need to not take the first drink. Because guess what? Then the gerbil wheel will go. I guarantee it. I've had one touch of alcohol since I got sober. And it was by mistake. I thought it was a mix of uh, orange juice and pineapple. I took a big swig. It was at Billy's house, and it was a margarita. And Lindy just went, Dad, I'm so sorry. She apologized 10 times. Dad, so sorry, so sorry. I should have told you. I should have told you. Because as soon as I had it, I tasted it. I went to the sink and I poured it out. She apologized about 10 times. I said, Lindy, I am upset. Dad, I told you I'm sorry. I said, I'm upset because who made these? There's hardly any tequila. <laughs> <laughs> who talks? <laughs> who talks? 